Uh, yeah, I read the book last night, the new one. It was like 9 p.m. and I was like, fuck, he's got a book. And I was working in the studio with Chad from the Neptunes. I was like, sorry, I have to go study for my Rick Ross exam tomorrow. And that was it. So I, but I love the book and I'm so glad I read it because there was so much good shit to talk about for this too. <laughs> I'm Mark Ronson, and this is the Fader Uncovered podcast. In this interview series, I'll be speaking with some of the most influential and groundbreaking musicians in the world, from genre-defining stars to avant-garde trailblazers, about their lives and careers. Each episode will be rooted in these musicians' iconic Fader cover stories, an institution that over the past two decades has told artists' stories like no other. The podcast is a chance for us to talk about the past, present, and future, reflecting on their breakthroughs, diving into their lives when their covers hit shelves, and discussing what the future might hold now. And it's an opportunity for me to speak to some of the artists I most admire. This is The Fader Uncovered with Mark Bronson. When I mentioned to people I was interviewing Rick Ross this week, I noticed their faces light up instantly. Rob, a 40-something Metallica superfan who owns the gym I go to, he gave his best Ross impression going, Ross, fucking love that guy. My wife chimed in with her version of Ross's signature tune starter, Maybach Music. An actual Maybach Music rapper and friend of mine, Wale, messaged, I gotta watch this, lol. I don't know if that was like a vote of underconfidence, I'm not sure. But all of this is probably because in the 15 years since he exploded onto the scene with his debut single, Hustling, maybe one of the most iconic debut hits in the history of hip hop, he's done the damn near impossible, pulling off the American dream. Through sheer talent, drive, and ambition, he's dropped 10 albums, among them five Billboard number ones, and among them, countless hip hop bangers. He's been one of the most respected MCs in the game since he came into it, part owing to a billion dollar voice, an ability to convey the most luxurious lifestyle with brilliant wordplay and an impeccable ear for beats. Be they glorious 70s soul infused or beats that just make you want to smash a window in. He's launched the stellar careers of Meek Mill and Wale among others with his Maybach music group. He's written a New York Times bestseller and his entrepreneurial instincts have launched countless successful business ventures. But the thing I think that's made him a national treasure, or internationally actually for that matter, is close to that thing that Snoop does. You know, when you come from the hustler's background and by being in people's lives for so long, delivering quality music, combined with an outsized personality, a large dose of humor, warmth, and charm, you just one day evolve into this people's champ. We spoke on the eve of his 11th album release, Richer Than I've Ever Been, and it's crazy to think it's been 15 years since his epic Fader cover, which is an excellent chronicling of life in the two very different Miamis, the glitzy South Beach and the grittier Carroll City. I myself the night before had just devoured Ross's latest book, The Perfect Day to Boss Up, which I'm telling you is honestly an amazing read, funny as hell, insightful and charming, very much like the boss himself. I love preparing for these interviews, but you really never know where they're gonna jump to. And this one's no different, taking a lightning quick tangent into the all important five out of five Mike album review in the Source magazine. So let's boss up with the legend. Mr. Ross. What's happening, big homie? How are you, sir? I'm wonderful. Pleasure, man. pleasure. I'm wonderful. Thank you for um, agreeing to do this. I know you're in LA and it's early and you must be on the promo blitz right now. Yeah, it's all good though, man. It's all oh. good. That's one of the cool parts of the, you know, putting the, the music together is actually, you know what I'm saying, fucking with the the journalists that deliver it to the, feed it to the people. Yeah. You're actually like, I noticed this because I was doing, I basically went to like, Rick Ross University yesterday. Like, I just doing all my research. Of course, I know the music as a DJ, as a fan, and the articles I read, but really, like, went deep. And, I, like, I, I, one thing I really loved was, like, Elliot Wilson, you did a giant interview with him once because he just DM'd you on Twitter. Like, you seem to not mind speaking to journalists because you have a lot to say, nothing to hide, and, and you like talking about the process. No, no, most definitely, most definitely. I fuck with the journalists, and I think that really just organically came from me 
being a fan of music I was. And when I was a younger, I began to consume. And, you know, it was a time when the five mics and all that shit meant something to a yeah. young Rose. Yeah. Little young high school, you know what I'm saying? Youngster, you know what I'm saying? What is the equivalent of that? I mean, you've talked about your feelings about the social media era and the positives and negatives, but like, what is the equivalent of the five mic like anointing? Like, we know that because we grew up in that era. And I'm just thinking like, what what is is it is it is it followers is it like what's the code what is the fight equivalent can you think about it you know that could be a a translation you know I, that's something that you have to put thought into because for me that was equivalent to a a young mc coming up in the streets a young nigga coming up from the streets that was the grammy before you ever knew what you know a really considered getting a grammy yeah the source. You know, the five mics was just about bars and beats. That's it. Yeah. Do you remember how many mics on Port of Miami? I mean, I'm sure you never forget something like that, but was it five, four? Honestly, I don't believe it was five. I don't recall. Hopefully, I, I'm sure it was still, you know. I'm sure it was at least four. Come I'm on. sure it was, as far as the five mics, the system, I'm sure it was still relevant then, but I just don't yeah. recall. I know. It, it, it might not have actually even been because that was 2006. Yeah, that was 2006. I read your book last night, the new book. What you think about it? I love it. It's it's entertaining. I never knew how funny you were in print. Like some of the words, like I never keep all my Fabergé eggs in one basket. Like the humor that I know is there in the lyrics. But I learned a lot and I think it was great. I mean, I was actually found out you wrote a book at 9 p.m. last night. So I was like, oh, fuck. And I tried to read half a hurricane as well, but I at least got through <laughs> Boss Up. So one story that I didn't know that you talk about that's really, really powerful, very moving, inspirational, and, and just f interesting as hell is the nearly quit moment, the car crash. Right. I really didn't know about that. Can you just delve into that just for the people listening who haven't read the book yet? What happened at that moment and why that was your nearly quit? Like if any reason you were going to let go? It was really one of those times where I had done a lot of writing for a lot of others and, you know, just on my personal trek, I would drive from Miami to Central Florida, North Florida, you know, however many hours, me and my buddies, you know, eating at fucking the gas stations where the truckers stop at, eating those hot dogs going around the thing, mm -hmm. you know, that type of shit. And, going to perform really for a little or nothing. You know what I'm saying? And to me, I've never been one big to complain, so it's not about the complaint. I ain't tripping. I enjoy going into these new markets, these little places, and if they gave me $300, cool. I, I ain't even tripping. And this particular trip, you know, we left, and that shit really drained everybody. You know what I'm saying? Rest in peace to my homie Peanut. You know, he died in another situation, but he was driving on the way back to Miami, and you know, I, I dozed off, you know what I'm saying? And I never, I wasn't even a big sleeper, but we all were exhausted and shit. Next thing you know, man, I woke up upside down in the median, man. Sound like the Escalade was finna explode. You know, we was all crawling out of the windshield. And it was just one of those times, damn. Then, you know, we barely survived the car crash. Then you get arrested because of your damn driver's license and this, that. So, damn, you know, your head swole, your eye closed, and you go to jail. Mm -hmm. And you only had $700 in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So it was just one yeah. of those times, man, where you had to really reflect on, is this shit realistic, homie? That was really like that moment, because you had obviously been doing it for a while as well at that point, and you'd had the deal with Swab House and Slip and Slide, but you said that, you just held on and you're like, if I can just get around the corner. And then of course you heard the beat for hustling. Right. And of course I had no idea that around the corner was literally possibly a month, two, three, four months away, you know? Yeah. You know, cause I had honed my talents. I had skills, I had talents, but well, you know, was, was the city ready for the music I was making? Was the state yeah. ready? And once I put, you know, what I did best and combined it with that production from the runners, young dudes out of Central Florida, out of Orlando, every damn hustling dropping, it changed the 
Did everybody know in the studio that night? I mean, you had made some good records, and you know, it's funny. Like, I even went back and listened to like the Eric Sermon joint that you did, right, and, right, right, right. and then of course, like the Suave House record that they put out after you blew up. But all great music. A lot of the seeds of what you were gonna do, soulful instrumentals, beats. But like, you must. Everybody in the room when you made hustling. The repetitiveness, each line is like an is an all time line. Each line would be the best line from somebody else's song. You must have known in the room that you were sitting on something, right? Oh, we most definitely. When I recorded the record, you know, I may have been in the studio with just myself and the engineer. Oh, the runners weren't even in there. They just gave you the No, nah, they I actually got the beat from my homie that was managing Trina at the time, okay. Josh Burke. He knew how much I love listening to beats. Yeah. When people give me a compliment about my ear or whatever, it's not, yeah, it's not even nothing that deep. It's just how much time I'm willing to spend listening to instrumentals, listening really? to beats. And he knew I yeah. was one of those dudes. So when he would go and get beats from certain individuals, it's almost like you could give them to me and I make a list of who I think these beats would be best for a trainer, trick daddy, so on right. and so forth. And that's what he did. And when I heard that beat, I remember the, it was a red CD that came from some top corporate Atlantic Records shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and when I got my hands on it, it was over. Is that what inspired the, the uh, I'm Into Distribution? Was that the Atlantic line? Because it was just sitting there and you knew it was like Atlantic City. Without a doubt. Without wow. a doubt. Because wow. Josh Burke was working with Slip and Slide. Slip and Slide had a distribution deal with Atlantic. And they will feel yeah. to the beats down, but none of the artists would want to listen to the beats but me. I told them, yeah. bring me all the beats. I listen to 200 beats a day. It don't matter. That's crazy. Do you remember? That explains a lot. I think it's the same thing with Jay-Z and especially in that Blueprint era. All, everyone was always like, he picks the best beats. But remember that scene in Fade to Black where he's just sitting, listening to beat after beat. And they're like, this is actually a funny story. Before I got on... I had to remake all the garbage beats that he was listening to in the studio because they couldn't go back to producers in that movie and say, hey, Jay's clowning your garbage beats. Is it cool if we clear this? Of course. So I was like, all right, well, I'll make a bunch of garbage beats that sound like they were made by different people because I was just a, you know, a DJ trying to get on and it was a check and whatever else. But That lets you know you have fly garbage beats. <laughs> I think so. the, the thing is that you talk about in your book too the 10,000 hours thing from the Malcolm Gladwell book is that you know behind every great huge overnight success there's all the work and all the Without time spent that you don't see Without a doubt. but hustling in a way is like is this perfect star is born moment when you think about it. Like I think a star is born moment always happens when you have the perfect artist, perfect movie or, or actor, whatever it is in the perfect role. It's like Eddie Murphy in 48 hours or Jennifer Hudson in dream girls, De Niro in mean street. So it's like, it's so hard to imagine you before you were famous because that arrival on the map was just so fucking iconic. And it felt, it felt huge. You know, I had a few glimpses, of you know some 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 you know some sunlight, but it was never anything close to being this bright, and it just eclipsed the whole you know soundscape where I was at. In the Fader article as well, like that Fader cover from two thousand six is great. It's a great article, and you really get the sense of you're like there isn't really a sense, and I don't know if that's not in your nature to be like wow, I can't believe. I made it because after all this struggling, it feels like you knew that you were always supposed to be there. Is that how it felt? Or did you have a little bit of like kicking yourself while this crazy groundswell is happening underneath you? Um, you know, when the record, the first record exploded and I just got, you know, a taste of what success somewhat felt like. I most definitely it was a part of me telling me. Um, this is what you've been working for, big homie. Now it's really time to go get it. It gets it gets greater later. It gets greater later. Let's let's keep going. And so while I did somewhat celebrate, you know, the success, the huge success of every yeah. damn hustle. And I remember it was the first record to sell a million ringtones. Remember that crazy fucking time? The, the yeah, ringtone time. That shit was crazy. But it was just, you know, it was just being recognized. It was recognition. I just knew. Uh, it was a lot more for me to do, a lot more I had to show. 
And Dre talks about it in that first Fader article too, which is interesting. He said you had to dumb it down a little, like uh, to, just to get. Uh, there was nothing dumb about hustling, but maybe it was like, was he talking about the word player? Were you trying to be too clever? What What did he mean by that? A lot of times it, it depends. You know what I mean? I will probably have to reread the article. But it for me, I, I always heard that I could make my wordplay extremely complicated. I could speed it up, you know. And when I'm from Miami, it was all about twerking and, you know, the Luke vibe and the club vibe. Yeah. And I was on a whole different side of the street with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so when yeah. you say dumb it down, uh, or I could just take it as me having fun with the wordplay the way I did. Room 222. 22. Yeah. She was 22. I'm riding to You know, so I was just like me having fun. And so it, it could go that way as well. But either way, it, it all makes sense. It's true, because now even thinking about the slip and slide, I mean, of course, there was Shut Up, Trick Daddy, which was a crazy record. That was quite hard. And I remember even in New York, that tore everything up. But you're right. It was very party. It was icons. It was everything. Take it to the and, house. And, you know, the, the biggest record yeah. was party. And club records, without a doubt. So were you at one point, I'm sure when you're starting off, like, are you thinking, how do I slot into this thing? Did it seem like a weird marriage or did you know you were always just going to break the mold and just have to be the outsider on Slip and Slide? Well, I knew one thing. It would take me to be nothing less than great to figure this out. Because I got to yep. figure this out. Being in Miami, this is the only outlet we really had. You know, this is the only bridge you could really walk across to go to that other side, you know? Yeah. And they were comfortable and had huge success with all party records. And like I said, I was talking about getting money. I was talking about hustling. Everything finally worked out. I found the right beat. I put the right raps on it. And once that record took off, I never was questioned again. Miami is and has been for a while a true legit epicenter of hip hop. OG legends have set up shop there. Pharrell, Timberland, newer stars like Little Pump, Denzel Curry and Kodak Black keep it rejuvenated. And Florida's, shall we say, looser rules during the pandemic have made it a real boom town in the past few years anyway. But when Ross came on the scene in 2006, you have to realize there was really nothing there, at least other than Uncle Luke, Trick Daddy, and Trina, party music for clubs and strip joints. DJ Khaled is surely the other most important figure in this transition. He went from being a local Miami radio DJ to one of the city's greatest champions to now one of the most important figures in all of modern hip hop and culture. But in the old days, Miami looked so much to New York for the musical cues. Even Khaled tells the story of flying up to New York City on a Friday night just to listen to Funkmaster Flex on the radio, then go to the store the next morning to buy all the records he heard Flex play the previous night, and then fly right back to Miami to play them himself on the radio. I mean, this is what you had to do in the pre-internet era. Ross's debut Port of Miami was the announcement and anointing of a new titan and put Miami on the map in a whole different way. I mean, the opening bars of hustling, the fanfare of the staccato strings into the church organ, that was enough to even let you know there was a new mayor in town. In fact, come to think of it, that very mix, the crazy adrenaline energy of the strings into the soulful gangster vibe of the organ would come to define the two styles of Rick Ross beats. The smash and grab drama of BMF or the soulful pimped out vibe of the Maybach music. Back after a break. When I think of your music, I think of like, this is a simplification, but like there's two sides, right? There's the beautiful musical stuff, you upholding the 70s tradition. I love that you always talk about Curtis Mayfield and this stuff. And then there's like, it's like what me and my friends call shit hammer music. Like you just want to take a hammer and smash oh, every like window that. and everything shit in your hammer. house. Shit, shit hammer. hammer. I like that. Yeah. And because you have MC Hammer, it's like, I guess there's a little play on that. But but I want to talk about like, what was the music growing up? There must have been, did you, the music in the house, was it a lot of soul and 70s and R&B and that stuff? That was obviously a big influence on you. Without a doubt. My mom being from Mississippi, my dad from Florida. 
You know, my mom, that's what she listened to, Johnny Taylor, Isaac Hayes. So I was, as far back as I can remember, I was listening to R&B music, soul music, gospel music. And as soon as yeah. I heard rap, as soon as I heard R&B, I remember I was, may have been in, shit, man, second or third grade when I heard um, Cool It Now, you know, Cool right. It Now. Ooh, I, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. that's something that my sister and all her friends came over to the house and I was forced to listen to that shit for five hours straight. And so yeah. at some point I began to enjoy and recognize the things I did. Even if it was a record I didn't like, I could still listen to it. And I, then I would just go past what I didn't like about it and find something in the record that I liked. Yeah. You know what I mean? And once you and yeah. I think once you do that, that's what makes you extremely articulate when it comes to the, the records and the music and the sounds, the melodies. Have you ever been to uh, the Stax Museum in Memphis and seen they have Isaac Hayes' old car there? Without a doubt. I may have been to every little shit hammer spot. Right, right. And I mean that in an iconic way. From Sun Records and, yeah. you know, just, you know, going down on Bill Street. Um, you know, I done spent many, many years over time and just, I done rolled past every artist who ever lived in Memphis House, you know, like that wow. type of shit. Yeah, me too, actually. In fact, that's why I went to Clarksdale where you said, you know, you talk about where you're from, yeah, where your mom's right, from, because right. it's a lot of people recognize it and as, as ground zero of the blues, American music, and... We went to that place, Reds. Reds, you know right. Reds, right, right. It's this crazy juke joint, and you know, you like, you can't find it. It's definitely not on any map, and just went in, and it's just, it's a small <laughs> hut with like this dude shredding the blues. It was incredible. Right, I've actually went to Ground Zero, that's owned by Morgan Freeman in Clarksdale. Oh, is it called Ground Zero? Yes, oh it shit, is. Okay. yeah, it's called Ground yeah. Zero, and I just listened to. A dude, one dude was actually playing the guitar. All his strings went out and he restringed the guitar while playing it. It was just some shit that was unfathomable. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I, I took a road trip. Jeff Basker, who I don't know if you met when on the, like the Dark Twisted Fantasy Day, he did a lot of, you know, all of the lights and a lot of production for uh, Kanye. Me and him decided we wanted to drive up from New Orleans to Chicago and trace the roots of the blues and the evolution of basically the music that we love so much. So we did all the things you said, Clarksdale, Memphis, Beale Street. It was incredible. No, you, that, that was a great experience. That's one for the books. I do love that tradition of music that you keep alive and you've been doing it from the beginning. And I always know, like, I love Certified Lover Boy. It's a great record. When You Only Live Twice comes on, like it's like a sigh of relief, though, for a guy like me, like that wow. sound, wow. that soul, but with like the kind of fury. Bink, I, I actually feel like this is no shade to Bink. I, Bink is one of my favorite producers ever, but actually I didn't realize how many records he was still making since I went through your catalog. Like you're kind of upholding that tradition. Tell me about some of, the, some of your favorite records that you made I feel like we got to just shout out Bink for a second. I don't know why. Uh, Santorini. It, it only makes yeah. sense. Santorini Grease, you know, that the music he made for the collab with Kanye on Devil in the New Dress. You know, that's that's yes. Bink, man. You know, the Santorini yeah. Grease. The one, he, you know, of course, he, he got work on his new project. And Bink is just, he's a one of one. You know, he's a very incredible very incredible producer and you know if not my favorite most definitely one of my favorites because we always make magic he's extremely stuck in his ways and to me that's what makes him a genius you know there was a lot of uh, kind of like uh chatter after the 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 kanye interview on drink champs when he i think he he said something kind of like not so nice about just plays and then everybody started to talk about who actually invented that style and really the blueprint style, the Kanye just, that thing really goes back to Bink. There was a story that when You Don't Know by Jay came out, a lot of people called Bink to congratulate him on the record. He's like, well, I didn't do a record called You Don't Know because he did originate the 45 
soul sample shit and everybody else took it and did some amazing shit with it but i just i was just remembering in the past month how much i love that dude's sound you know it's phenomenal and what bink does is second to none what bink does is second to none and ricky rose said it quote me there have been some wonderful connections that have come out of doing this show in fact, after connecting for the season one finale, Damon Auburn and I ended up working on an upcoming tune featuring Wale. And immediately following my Pharrell combo, I ended up getting back in touch with Chad Hugo, Pharrell's partner from the Neptunes, and we spent the past week working on some new music. At one point this week, I asked Chad where he got all those amazing drum sounds from on the early Neptunes records, because they really were incredible. And he told me, well, I chopped up a lot of breaks, but I also got a disc of drum sounds from Bink Dog aka Bink. My jaw kind of dropped, A, because I live for a little hip-hop trivia like this, but B, I love the idea of these young fledgling producers who are soon going to change the sound of hip-hop in very different ways, passing their sounds back and forth like this camaraderie. And C, their sounds were actually nothing alike. The Neptunes made this gospel punk future funk, and Bink made this blueprint era sped up soul sample dramatic bangers. And while Bink's name might not ring off like some of his contemporaries, he's made classics. I mean, he co-produced Blackstreet, Don't Leave Me. I mean, that's how far it goes back. And along with Kanye and Just Blaze, he pioneered a true sound in hip hop, a great sound that's still alive because of artists like Drake and Rick Ross. I, is Devil in a New Dress? I, of course, around the time you always, this was, you were like, this is the best verse i've ever written everybody knows it's an incredible verse is it still up there is it still the bar for you the best verse or you <laughs> feel like you beat it since then it's, it's most definitely one of one of the favorites you know because you know we just let it was all about the production we let it breathe you know what i'm saying i was out in hawaii with kanye and it was just one of those times and it was a special time it was a special piece of art you know just for the ones that still consider it you know rose best verse of one of Rosé favorites, it will be topped. And you talk about it in the book. There's a lot of great stories about, my favorite story that really is like a story that changed the history of music is about the clips Kanye didn't know about Pusha. Do you mind just shedding a little light or retelling that story for, for everybody? Because that's an incredible story. It's just one of those things where I won't say that Ye didn't know about him. You know, the dog was a, a nasty, super nice nigga, but it was just one of those times we was in the studio and, you know, I just sparked a certain conversation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So basically, Kanye found out that, like, he had done a verse for T.I. and it had ended up on this clip song and he didn't know and he was, like, about to take it, wasn't he, or take it off because he didn't know and you were like, no, no, the clips are, like, push is great. Like, you should get him out here. And that really is like him signing to good music, really. Uh, you're kind of responsible for that in some ways. And I don't even want that responsibility. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> them, both of yeah. them dudes, both of them dudes, great. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Both of them. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's very nice and modest. And with the success you have, you can say that. I love um, the book. I mean, it's amazing that you got it out so fast because it feels like a lot of the things you're talking about, COVID or the fungus, which I love, and how you the fungus call is it. still among us. The fungus is still among us. Yeah, the fungus um, is still among us. Wow. Um, how? Because it feels like you're writing about this stuff that, like, we're really still in the middle of it. But your COVID story was crazy because you'd actually had it before we knew what it was. Right. I had the fungus before we even knew what the fungus was. That's why I still refer to it as the fungus. Yeah. Because yeah, when so. I went looking for help, nobody, they asked me, was I petting elephants while I was out of the country? Did you ride a camel? I'm like, yo, stop. This is the fungus. Where were you? Were you somewhere, you were somewhere exotic or something? Oh, I have, I most definitely went international. I have been over in, you know, um, London. I had been over in Paris. I had been a lot of different, I had been traveling. Yeah. And yeah. while I was traveling, I'm going through London and I'm crossing so many, you know, Asian people at the time and they all had their masks on. And I just yeah. remember thinking back like, yo, Michael Jackson been up on his mask. 
you know, 40 years ago. You know what I'm saying? So then they announce that this is what it is, and you're like, oh, shit, that must be that thing that nearly took me out the game for I knew without a, a doubt. When they told me it yeah. was two weeks, you know, I knew without a doubt that was the fungus I had because I remember it. I counted the days. I knew it was two weeks. Yeah. So you spent, got to spend the most amount of time ever probably in one place after 15 years of just the craziest grind ever and of uh, not just a grind because you love it but what what was that like of first that readjustment was it wonderful were you afraid you talk about the fungus and how it obviously is fucking with the revenue streams but was there some kind of peace that you had most definitely most definitely as far as what i got out of it on a personal level i, I would do it all over you know what i mean the time i got to spend just you know speaking and going back and forth with my family, my team, myself, more importantly. You know, I went and bought the tractor, started cutting my own grass. I pulled the weeds out of my own flower beds, that type of shit. And uh, yeah. I was just being more creative. That's when the book came into play. Perfect day to boss up. Why not? I saw a picture of you a, a couple of months back, and it was amazing. One, honestly, one of my favorite pictures I've seen it's like you're in the tractor and it's like it's just a picture of a man at peace like you just look like you're you're in the tractor you have the blunt it's a good picture it's a beautiful oh, day man. and i just like oh, that is phenomenal. just phenomenal phenomenal that's an amazing day yeah that's just something everyone wants to aspire to at peace your phone off no radio just a blunt yeah you got 300 blunt, acres to cut Jesus, that, that is a lot. Does that take all day? You can't do that in one day, even in like a crazy job nah, nah, you have. It's not a chance. So what do you do? What? How much can you do in a day? The majority of the part I'm responsible for, I could cut in eight hours. Yeah. I usually have three or four more other homies on those spin arounds going yeah. through all the other, yeah. you know, where the terrain ain't as flat. You know, I cover all the flat spots. Where yeah. I get to see the traffic and I get to see the most animals because that's what I want to see. And the eight hours in there, are you listening to beats? Are you listening to music? Are you meditating? You're just no, thinking like I'm this? Usually, I usually want silence. Oh, really? Yeah. That's a great wow. time to talk to yourself. Yeah. Blunt yeah. burning. You want to track the yeah. John Deere Mafia. <laughs> So the point of the book, really, other than being very entertaining and a great read and great anecdotes, is really to inspire people how to how to boss up, like you said. Like, it's got business. Yeah, without uh, a doubt. Was that the reason? Because the first one's a memoir, and this was really to inspire. Is that why you decided to write it? Right, right. The first one was about me just feeling how amazing I am. I had to fulfill yeah. that, scratch that off the list. Boom. Yeah. And now the, the second book was more about me just fulfilling the answers I get when I wake up to social media. Rose, how do yeah. you do this? You got 20 business partners. How does this happen? And that's where the book really comes in. Perfect day to boss up, which really breaks down just the fact of you got to take advantage of those 24 hours that we all get every day. Yeah. We got to make the most of those. How can we multiply our output? And that's what it's about. And that's what I tell people the most. I really like as well, and it, it reminded me of something when you talked about when you first got to the farm, because you bought this farm of Vander Holyfield's giant estate, and you realized that if you bought your own machinery, like how an entrepreneur would think that you could save money, right? You, like, why do I need to rent this shit? Why rent it? Why pay 15? From my understanding, there was 17 people that was right. working seven days a week. I don't need that. I know what I'm so, going to do. I'm going to go to John Deere and go get the biggest tractor with the widest hitch I could put on the back. And I'm going to roll up it, 10 blunts and don't stop. Yes. The thing that it totally reminded me instantly of was in the Fader article back from 2006. You're driving through Miami and you're pointing at all the posters that you put up and you said, see these? We went out and we got our own printing factory and we got our own cherry pickers so we could put the shit higher than everybody else. And I was like, wow, like 15 years later, it's like the same. Uh, we still hands on. When we own a piece of the Miami Heat, we'll be selling jerseys out front. Yeah. yeah. How is that going? Because you talk in the book about the hundred, it's a hundred million dollar goal. You're inching towards that and you're just up there and to get a piece of the heat, but... 
I I have a feeling. Do you think really when you get to a hundred million, you get the piece of the heat, you'll be able to sit back? I feel like with most people, once you achieve these goals, the people that can't quite sit still, there'll be a new goal. I'm not sure because we already surpassed a hundred million. You know what I mean? Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. And you know what, what about but, the heat? But just you know, we we haven't sat down and had a serious conversation. We got a great yeah. relationship with the Heat. They know I'm going to support them, you know, regardless of what goes down. But that's something I really, you know, ser- really seriously move forward with if I could make that happen. I think that uh, I have a... I go to therapy. Ain't nothing wrong with that. So I basically, my therapist is always like, I take gigs. I take some gigs for money gigs, these things that I don't really want to do sometimes. And I'm always like, am I doing this because... I want to do this gig or because I'm worried that the money is going to freeze up and one day the, the gigs are going to stop coming, sky's going to fall in. So he's always like, well, there's two main motivations of human behavior, fear and desire. So you got to pick. Do you feel like, because obviously you have an incredible ambition and a drive, do you ever feel like some of that thing is driven by the same, like what if the money runs out one day or is it just like, is it a positive thing? No, not at all. It's not about the money. For me, it's the, it has to be the desire because I still could fly in late night, get on my story, talk about the music, knowing in two hours I got to get up and do an interview that I'm going to look forward to doing. Yeah. I still look forward to going to the club. I look forward to being in Vegas. I look forward to going to Dreas. I still look forward to laying my fucking outfit out, man. Decide yeah. what watch I'm aware today, the rose gold, the rose, what we going to do, what, you know, so I'm still, I'm just a purist when it comes to this shit right here. Uh, and even like the bar mitzvahs and the weddings and stuff like that, that's just like, okay, cool, go shake hands, some cute kids, why not? Of course. Those yeah. some of, yeah, some of the bar mitzvahs I've done, man, I've had some of the funnest times ever. I've been to big ass mansions and they flew me in or in the back and the, they put me in the back seat of a car. I've been at a bar mitzvah where I was in the back seat of a car and they drove me into the middle of the party. This is the car, the gift they're giving. You know, that daughter, I'm that daughter's favorite artist. I get out the back seat. And when I tell you like, yo, this shit was some of the, I had the, the most fun. You know what I mean? And then I run into so many people from the parties later on, man. And we actually yeah. keep relationships. So that's what I that's mean crazy. by I love what I do. You know what I mean? And the way I move, yeah. the music I make, it you know, it just has a certain energy. I'm on, on some boss energy. So when people introduce themselves, they introduce me, their better selves, their bigger selves. And so it's all love. It's amazing. I just think to myself for that girl at 13 who had Rick Ross perform at her 13th birthday party by Mitzvah Redder, like, it's all downhill. Like, what's going to happen? What, what in her life is going to ever make her have, like, but whatever. That's not your problem. That's not your problem. <laughs> we got we to gotta continue to raise the bar. That's the challenge we all got, man. The perfect day to boss up is technically billed as an advice how-to book. And that makes sense. Ross's life is an incredible success story. And his approach to making money, well, I, I wish I had a bit more of that. I do wish I could go into a bar mitzvah like, hell yeah, let's do this. Let's have the best time ever. Because I'm honestly a bit more like, Mark, you're a sellout. Look what you'll do for a check. But it's like, why shouldn't every gig be the best ever? It's a wonderful thing to know that any crowd wants to see you do your thing. And the fact that you can lift that occasion just with your presence and doing what you do, well, that's sort of a mitzvah in itself. You get the feeling that Ross could actually just walk around a party smiling and high-fiving and they would instantly be psyched. That's the people's champ part of him shining through. But he earned that through talent and persistence and a whole lot of charisma. So there's some really hilarious shit in the, in the book, honestly. Like, I, I really love, there's some, like, little language. Like, you tell this amazing story, it's, and it and it's, f- feels totally real about going to visit Kanye at, um, where is it? In, in Atlanta, when right. he's at the Tyler Perry thing. And you say the first person that walks in, like, when you, you see is Rick Fox, who's, like, running 
the business. And I, and I love you have this line. I have to quote it because I was just like, I was like laughing out loud. This is no shade to Rick Fox, but you said, I always knew Rick Fox to be a reliable small Ford. I didn't know he was working for Kanye. Like, that's if you could ever give a definition of Rick Fox, like, for life, like there's certain players that are just great at filling no, no, those no, holes. No, 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 no. You gotta understand this. This is this is this is Rick Ross um, walking through the warehouse that's owned by the gentleman who owns Chick Fil A. We stopped, shook hands with him. Yeah, I come walking through Kanye, showing me around, showing me the fashion side of the warehouse. We walk through the music side, the studio side. We listen to production beats so so on and so forth and then he walks me over into the presidential campaign side it's okay. one thing to know rick fox for being an nba player a small forward and it's yeah. one thing to know him for being an nba player a small forward and working for kanye and then there's knowing rick fox for being an nba player a small forward an employee for kanye and then the guy that's running the presidential campaign. Oh, he's running the campaign. He wants to just, okay, okay, wow. Oh, I most definitely was, I was in an amazing moment. And I, I wish I'd do it all over again. I wish I could just. Yeah. I would have been less, I would have been less in awe. I wish I could have just really enjoyed the moment a little more. Instead of looking around and you see Rick Fox, you know, at the, chalkboard and you look I look to my right and it's Kanye next to me and then I looked to my left there was an older white guy I looked like a scientist you sure wasn't Sean Bradley I'm not sure who it was I just was like okay. Rose you got yourself in some shit today buddy <laughs> I also like you tell it you're not afraid to tell it exactly kind of how it happened but in a in a funny way and you recognize the some of the craziness of it. But then I love at the end, it's just you and Kanye, like, you're like, I need beats. And he's like, all right, well, if you got rhymes, cool. Like, it's yeah, just like at the end of the day, because you talk about, you guys go back 20 years. Yeah, we do. We go back a long time. And, and it's just, that was the dope thing about the whole conversation to me was the fact that it was still about music, regardless of how much success he's having with fashion, clothes, you know, getting to live out his dreams. That was some bucket list shit. I'm running for president. I'm sure that's real cool to talk about it all. The, you know, the, the the parties, you know, having the glass of Luke Belair with some friends. You know, that's a great conversation piece. But at the end of the day, it went back to the music. Yeah. It went back yeah. to the beats. It went back to the yeah. raps, the ideas. And so I was just like, yo, you know, I get it. I get it. I see what he's doing. Also, another thing that really stuck in my mind about the book is you've, you know, obviously been embroiled in a, some verbal wars yourself, but you seem to have this, you're like the harshest put down that you've ever heard is that we talk about the Anderson Cooper when Donald Trump lost the thing and he calls Trump an obese turtle. And I feel like it was just like, I did that went over my head even when that happened, but you seem to be like, really like a lot of respect you're like if there was a full like fucking burn obese turtle you really give it up to anderson cooper for that <laughs> that was that was hilarious i never could you know that was funny you gotta admit that it's incredible i don't even know how i missed it the first time and you know there were a lot of like fuck face mcorange there were a lot of great insults but obese turtle really just does <laughs> everything it needs to do um, so the album comes out Friday. Everybody download it December 10th. Of course. I can't wait. So tell me about this record and in, in an incredible discography, so much solid, you know, as much as anybody ever. What, what does this record mean to you and, and how is it maybe uh, different? I think, I think what it means to me is just being um, somebody that was always on my own pedestal for the things I brought to the game. I think that's what made me unique coming from the South. But the wordplay was much elevated than the standard or the norm. And I just got better and better. You know, by the time I, I released my debut, Port of Miami, which a lot of people, you know, heralded as a classic. By the time I was at Deeper Than Rap, people knew this shit was going somewhat different. Teflon Don came. 
mastermind came when I put together the record with Dr. Dre, Jay Z, and myself. Three Kings. Yeah, Three Kings. And so three it was kings. just I, I just began to show people my vision and what you know the things I'm capable of and still capable of. And so here I am on uh, album number eleven, and I'm still just depending solely on the bars, the beats. Mm -hmm. That's what I really focused on. And so when you hear these records, when you hear Little Havana and the vibe and the intro by Willie Falcone, the mm -hmm. biggest kingpin in the history of shit, it could be the U.S., man. Uh, just to, yeah, he, to, to he, introduce the album and set the tone, and I did the rest. Yeah. Uh, and are there any new features or people that you have a work with on this record? Or did you decide to try anything uh, new musically? Well, I got to actually get a verse from Major Nine, a young artist coming out of Miami. You know, he we worked in the past. Um, Apple of my eye, he actually produced. He's an incredible producer, and as well as an artist, as well as Young and Ace out of Central Florida. We did an incredible record. I really feel it's going to really hit the streets in a major, major way. And um, um, I got to exchange bars with Benny the Butcher, you know, some cool nice. things. Nice. Me, Wale, Future, we got on another record, One Words. And, you know, everything just, you know, it sits in its own place. And I wanted yeah. to just make sure I remain creative so that it was always not only just me being here because I wanted, wanted to, but it was a reason for me to be here. In the book as well, you s I am sure there's many chapters to come, but you said, you know, I'm not finished yet. Now I want to change the world. And that's like a big... You've done a you've done so much. You have so many business ventures. You've changed music. You've changed business. You have these books now. New York Times bestsellers. The way you say now I want to change the world, it it feels like it's got some kind of weight, like you're either talking about foundation, charity, political something. Is it what what what's really left? It's a lot left. It's a lot left. You know, just me being the leader, me being at the forefront. It's a lot left, you know what I mean? Just beginning with health, just beginning with ourselves. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I touched on a few things last year with Jet Doc, you know, and it's it's a lot more things to do. And we're going to see, and I'm going to keep going. Well, I can't wait to hear the album, and thank you for uh, giving the time. You know, obviously, I had signed Wale way back in the day, and then right. we had a deal with Interscope that didn't work out, and the best thing that ever happened was you picking him up, and I love him, and I was so happy to see that success that you guys had together. So I texted him last night, and I was like, yo, give me, like, a secret question, like, to something to ask Rose, and he was like, and I ain't got nothing, but I'd love to be a... I want to watch that fucking conversation. And it was funny. I was like, I think it's, I think it's going to be fine. Oh, without a doubt. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the music over the years, and I love the book, and uh, best of luck with everything. Man, you already know, man. I'm here. Whenever you want to do something, let's get some, let's make some dope shit, homie. I'm here. Let's do it. Let's do it. I love the fucking bass guitar. It's my favorite. It's just like it's your favorite. Let's go. Let's turn up. Love. I love the bass guitar. It's probably my favorite instrument to play. Rick Ross once told a story of putting the finishing touches on his album Black Market and at the very last minute he flew out his bass player to play on all the songs because he missed that feeling, that sound in the music from his earlier records. I knew we'd get along when I read that actually. This whole experience of hosting the Fader Uncovered for the past two seasons and living out all my teenage journal fantasies has been pretty wonderful. I'm not gonna lie, it's a lot of work mainly because I don't know how to do anything without over-preparing to the hilt. Reading books, listening to entire back catalogs, watching docs, scouring the net, and then also writing these little break pieces hoping to keep you interested and entertained in your headphones or on the train or in the car, wherever you might be. But I've also learned so much from these brilliant guests. I can't even sit down to meditate anymore without thinking of some sage advice from Jim James of my morning jacket. Be like the leaf. So this concludes season two of The Fader Uncovered with me, Mark Ronson. Our podcast is taking a short break and will return in early 2022. In the meantime, all episodes from season one and two are available wherever you get your podcasts. So thank you for listening. Take me out with The Fader. Thanks again to Rick Ross for taking the time to talk with us. A special Fader thank you to our Grammy and Oscar award winning host, Mark Ronson. 
please visit thefader.com slash podcasts to read the original cover story and check out a playlist of artists mentioned in this episode. If you like the show, please share it and review us on your favorite podcast app. Executive producers Rob Stone and John Cohen for the Fader Podcast Network. Talent booking Robert English. Producers Alex Robert Ross and Maddie Russell Shapiro. Directed by Daniel Nevetta and produced by the Fader in association with BYT.NYC. Engineered and mixed by David Rogers Barry. Theme music by DJ Premier. For Fader Uncovered merchandise, please visit shop.thefader.com. Thanks.